Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church of Greensburg. It is good to be back. We have seen several new faces today. Yeah. Several new faces have seen us today. So that is, uh, it's always fun to meet new people. Or at least I like meeting new people. Some of you may not feel that way, but um, it's good to meet all of our visitors and all those who have returned. Uh, this Sunday is a momentous Sunday. It is our first Sunday with our brand new hymnals, The Glory to God. If you did not uh, bring one up with you, and if you have not received one yet, uh, please just raise your hand, and I think that uh, someone will get them to you. Uh, Jeff or Kathy or Dennis or somebody who is standing down below. Um, so, we want to thank the uh, Worship Committee and the Million Fund uh, for, uh, for suggesting us purchasing these and uh, for giving the gifts to be able to purchase those. You will notice in your bulletins that uh, you have a chance to dedicate uh, the hymnals to a loved one or in memory of, in honor of someone. So if that is something you desire to do, uh, please fill that out and just put it in the offering tray uh, at the end of the service. Number two is a joy, but a little bit of a sadness at the moment. Uh, we are celebrating Mary Norwell's 95th birthday today. But if you were able to make it to her party yesterday, you realize that there were so many people who showed up to wish her a happy birthday. And she was just so exhausted from that party that she was not able to attend this morning. But we will sing her happy birthday uh, just in honor of that. And I say, uh, is everybody ready now? Oh, you're pointing at someone. Oh, well, yes, she can watch on service later, so we will be singing to her, and uh, is there anybody who wants to start us off in a good key, or do you want to start in my key? Reception 
for our beloved Office Administrative Assistant, Diana Blanford. Uh, she will be retiring at the end of this month. I know that she has many relationships with many of you all and that she has been a rock in this church for the past uh, six, seven, eight years. I forget how many at this moment, but uh, we hope that you all can make it to honor her and to say farewell and thank you for all she has done. The personnel committee is taking up the collection for Diana to show our thanks and appreciation and to gift her for her retirement. If you are interested in offering to that, please see Kathy Bencourt. And lastly, on Pentecost, we will be collecting the Pentecost offering. And this is an offering that goes to youth and children's ministry. And we have heard from many of you the importance of uh, youth and Children's Ministry and the Christian Ed uh, Committee has been restocked and refueled and we are thank give thanks to all those who volunteer to be on it. So we believe that we'll be able to support all that this community uh, ministers to, seniors and the young, and all in between. And the exciting thing about the Pentecost offering is that 40% of it stays here and with this congregation to support our youth and children's ministries. So we are, that will help us significantly, and we hope that you are able to give to that on May 23rd. <clears throat> and an update for the new office administrative assistant, we have received multiple uh, applications and several strong applications. We have interviewed several and are hoping to get in a couple more interviews this week. Uh, we learned that having a two-week vacation uh, in the middle of when we start and uh, the rest of the time poses a little bit of a you know, standstill of things, but uh, the candidates are still excited to speak with us and we may to announce soon who it is God has brought uh, to fill Diana's shoes, and perhaps we'll see what goes from there. Jeff, it's a small thing, but it always bugged me. But as you leave today, there are actually waste baskets out there, <laughs> <laughs> and you can throw those little plastic cups right away, right away. <laughs> So we are still taking our individual communions, and if you are holding on to it by the end of the service, or see it near you, we ask that you uh, uh, please place it in a waste receptacle. Yes. I don't know. I was running around, but uh, I don't know if you mentioned uh, the National Day of Prayer. It's this coming Thursday. It's the first Thursday of May. I don't. I'm not seeing anything as far as community. But Diana did put a link in the e call. Uh, I believe it's Thursday evening at 8 uh, that you can go online and uh, participate in a service that will be online uh, for the National Day of Prayer this Thursday. Okay, the National Day of Prayer is this Thursday, and we are unaware if there are community events taking place, but there is an online service at 8 o'clock. The link is in your email. Great. Um, last announcement is uh, a good news to share. Um, Mike Chapman has been tested and is cancer free. Oh.
This is a little out of order, and uh, I hope you can hear me, because what I'm going to say is something I want to say. Uh, to begin with, I haven't asked anybody if they missed you guys, but I missed you. So, <laughs>
us rise and join for this morning's call to worry. The vine emerges from the earth, nourished and nourishing. Rises without, without visible connection, roots hidden, hidden promise unknown. Strong to withstand storms, fragile when plucked too soon. So it is that we grow, nourished by invisible connections to the living God, called to nourish that which is seen and that which is yet buried within. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for gathering us here today. We thank you for the spirit that is in this room, moving between us, amongst us, and we ask that, God, while your spirit is with us, that you minister to our hearts, that you take us to the places we need to go, that we hear what we need to hear, that we experience what we need to experience while in your presence together. We pray that you have gathered us today, that we release to you all that's on our heart that's been weighing us down, and that we receive from you that which will carry us forward. This we pray together. In God's name we pray. Amen. 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 And let us join in our opening hymn, number 611. Joyful, joyful, we adore you. Jesus, 
Heal the hidden springs of our personalities. Thank you, holy friend, for answering our prayers before we get around to asking them and for doing much more than we ask or think. Through your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Christ Jesus, we are a radically renewed community. Thanks be to God. All things are done away with. All things become new. Thanks be to God. We are agents of grace and reconciliation. Thanks be to God. With every step or stumble, Christ will be with us. Thanks be to God.
and through the actions of others. We pray, God, that as your word is read and spoken today, you speak to our hearts, to our lives, that you fill us with exactly what we need to carry on together in this world, showing your love to all we encounter. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lessons this morning are a gospel lesson from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, and an epistle lesson from the epistle 1 John, chapter 4, verses 4 through 21. Listen now for the word of God, a reading from John. I am the true vine, and my Abba is the vine grower, who cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, but prunes the fruitful ones to increase their yield. You've been pruned already, thanks to the word that I've spoken to you. Live on in me as I do in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself apart from the vine, neither can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who live in me and I in them will bear abundant fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Those who don't live in me are like withered, rejected branches to be picked up and thrown on the fire and burned. If you live on in me, and my words live on in you, ask whatever you want, and I will do it for you. My Abba will be glorified if you bear much fruit, and thus prove to be my disciples. And from the epistle, 1 John. Dear friends, you have already overcome these false prophets because you are from God and have in you the one who is greater than anyone in the world. As for them, they are of the world. They speak the language of the world and the world listens to them. But we are from God and those who know God listen to us. Those who are not of God refuse to listen to us. This is how we can tell the spirit of truth from the spirit of falsehood. Beloved, let us love one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is begotten of God and has knowledge of God. Those who do not love know nothing of God, for God is love. God's love was revealed in our midst in this way, by sending the only begotten into the world, that we might have faith through the anointed one. Love, then, consists in this, not that we have loved God, but God has loved us and has sent the only begotten to be an offering. Beloved, if God has loved us so, we must have the same love for one another. No one has ever seen God. Yet if we love one another, God dwells in us. And God's love is brought to perfection in us. The way we know that we remain in God, in God in us, is that we have been given the Spirit. We have seen for ourselves and can testify that God has sent the only begotten as Savior of the world. When we acknowledge that Jesus is the only begotten, God dwells in them and they in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God and God in them. Love will come to perfection in us when we face the day of judgment without fear. Because our relation to this world is just like Christ's. 
There is no fear in love, for perfect love drives out fear. To fear is to expect punishment, and anyone who is afraid is still imperfect in love. We love because God first loved us. If you say you love God but hate your sister or brother, you're a liar. For you cannot love God whom you have not seen if you hate your neighbor whom you have seen. If we love God, we should love our sisters and brothers as well. We have this commandment from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I recently listened to a radio broadcast that lifted up a question from famous physicist Richard Feynman, one that he asked his students at Caltech in 1961. And I'm sure you all know it well, so why don't you say it before? <laughs> No, okay. Well, he asked his students, if in some cataclysm, all of scientific knowledge were to be destroyed and only one sentence was passed on to the next generation of creatures, what statement would contain the most information in the fewest words? And since you didn't know his question, I'm suspecting you don't know his answer. And if you're interested in it, listen to me now. If not, Feynman states, it is the atomic hypothesis, which states all things are made of atoms. And that is little particles that move around in perpetual motion attracting each other when they're a little distant apart, but repelling when being squeezed into one another. He then goes on to say, in that one sentence, you will see there is an enormous amount of information about the world if just a little imagination and thinking are applied. Now, since I dropped my science classes in college, I will not go on to explain that further because <laughs> I don't know it. Uh, but I think there is wisdom in Feynman's answer and in his question. His question left me wonder. Well, I'm not much into science, but if there was some cataclysm, and all religious slash theological slash Christological eschatological knowledge were to be destroyed. And only one sentence slash one word passed on to the next generation of creatures. What statement, what word would contain the most information with the fewest words? So I asked God over and over for the answer to be Garrett was right. <laughs> God swiftly replied, no, every time. I mean, really, should we trust God? No. But anyways, God said no, pointing me back to scripture, pointing me to experience, pointing me to the way things feel they should be. And the answer was clear. Love. For anyone who has ever loved before, you know that love is difficult. It's difficult because it forces us to pay attention to ourselves and to one another in order that we can determine if a way can be made, if a way can be made for two beings to go forward together or perhaps more than two beings. Beings which often think, see, feel, and experience life differently. Can we move on together in this world in a way that's beneficial to each and life-giving relationship? Love. 
Turning back to Feynman's answer to his question, there is insight to be gained if we apply the imagination he suggests. And we'll do so by changing atoms to humans. And I believe it works. So here's the modification. The human hypothesis, which states all things are made of humans, that doesn't work, but <laughs> little beings that move around in perpetual motion, attracting each other when they're a little distant apart, but repelling from each other and being squeezed together. Admittedly, a little clunky at the beginning, but focusing on the last two clauses, it smooths, it smooths out. This is what happens when you don't talk for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Humans attract each other when there's some distance between them. But when they're being squeezed together, they repel from one another. And the way I read this is we attract those that we allow to be themselves, that repel those that we try to be, that we try to force to be something that they are not. In other words, we love those that we allow to be what God created them to be, but turn away those that we try to make into our image of what we feel they should be. And isn't there an age-old story, or at least the Hallmark Channel, that gives us story after story of person A loving person B, yet controlling everything person B does, thusly driving them away to person C, who allows them to be who they truly are? That might be lifetime, maybe not. <laughs> but I know this, and it's sad, but we see it over and over again. True love allows distance. It allows difference. It is not squeezing or forcing another to be bound to you or being bound to us. That's called control. That's manipulation. These things drive others away. <laughs> Love, on the other hand, draws us in. It creates bonds. Bonds that are stronger than anything we could ever imagine. Now the writer of 1 John is speaking to a certain community of believers in this morning's epistle lesson. But I'm of the impression that there is enough scriptural evidence of God's expansive welcome that, the composer, that what the composer of the first letter of John is saying to a particular community applies to whomever we encounter, no matter if they're a part of our community or not, which is, we are to love one another. And though it might seem counterintuitive, loving one another begins with loving oneself. And here's my logic. When I'm not loving myself, when I'm not giving myself some space from others, when I'm not allowing myself to have differences from others, I'm not a loving person towards the others that I say I want to love. Brief example. By brief, I mean 8,367 words. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare yourselves. No. In my life, I've preached 3,337 sermons on the importance of saying no. And if you haven't got it, I might exaggerate from time to time. But regardless, somewhere in my career, I've preached between 1 and 3,337. 337 sermons on the importance of saying no. But these days, the word only escapes my mouth in ways I don't want it to. And that's when I'm beyond exhausted to lovingly, lovingly converse or explain to Caleb or Magdalena how their actions or inactions are not how we are to behave. Funnily enough, I'm often beyond exhausted because I hate to say no to others. You know that healthy no. The one that I've preached on one 
3,337 tacos. And by doing this, I'm not showing myself love because I'm trying to force things together that aren't or shouldn't be at that time forced together. I'm not allowing myself to be different from someone else. Or just saying, Gary, you need to rest. No, you can't take that on. Now before going further, there's truth and example I share, but I exaggerate a bit. But I'm also very aware of and conscious of burnout. And I do finally get to the point where I do say no. And I set boundaries. So don't, you know, well, you can come, you know, clean our house and do whatever, you know, those things if you want, but <laughs> don't stress out too much. But the reason I use the above, the above examples, because I feel it's one with which most of us can connect. Through my culture, and I presume yours, it's been enforced in me that, and I assume you, that if you say no to someone else, you're being selfish. And being selfish isn't good. And because we want to be good, we say yes to everything. Now this isn't all the time, but when I am saying yes too often, when I'm not using a healthy no, I'm doing so because I don't want to disappoint others. I want others to like me. I want them to think I'm a good person because, well, I said yes. I wasn't selfish. I didn't say no. I do want to be a good person that I was trying to be. But because I'm not giving myself space to perhaps disappoint others by saying no, I'm not showing myself the love that I need. And I often end up repelling away those that I was trying to please by saying yes in the first place. But thankfully, there's grace. But that's in another series of 8,000 sermons. <laughs> Turning to this morning's gospel lesson, Jesus speaks to us saying, Live on in me as I do in you. More familiar, more from other translations are more familiar. Abide in me as I abide in you. To me, this is Jesus' call to us to love ourselves first. We love ourselves by abiding in Christ, by living in a way of love that honors the one who was and is love, in life, in death, in resurrection, and in ascension. Back to the cultural conditioning I lifted up earlier. Jesus didn't buy into it. Crowds following Jesus wanted to hear his teachings, receive his miraculous healings, and yet he'd tell them no when he dismissed them and went by himself to pray. Jesus modeled how we're to love ourselves. And saying no isn't the only way Jesus modeled how we're to love ourselves. Jesus going off to pray wasn't the only way he modeled it. He also showed us that we are to know who we are. He showed us that we're not to let others define us and that we're to balance our lives with work, play, worship, showing grace, showing mercy, showing love to all those he encountered, not just those in his particular group. Now reading further in this morning's gospel lesson, we when we live on in love, when we abide in Christ, we bear fruits. So here's a little homework assignment for you. Go home and finish reading John 15. I'll see you writing it down. <laughs> but answer this question. What is the fruit that we bear when we live on in love? Still not writing it down. Well, I'm taking that you're all not going to do this. And, you know, if I were in your seats, I wouldn't be doing it either. So I'll just give you the answer. It's loving one another. Live on in love. Love yourself first. 
And then we produce fruit, the fruit of loving one another. Crazy, isn't it? And I think it is. But perhaps, though, it's the right kind of crazy. You know, that crazy that really can't be explained. The one that allows you to love someone else, yourself, God, despite all the differences, all the letdowns, all the unanswered questions that we have. Live on in love as Christ lives in us. Bear Christ's fruit of loving one another. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, is this congregation anything like me? Hearing it be said, Put yourself first sometimes. This is the last thing they ever heard of growing up. But God, when we give and give and give to others, we have nothing left in us to continue to give. So it's my prayer that all those who needed to hear this today heard it. That they'll take the time for themselves that they need that they'll set the boundaries that they need in their lives to love themselves first, to live on in you, that we are, that we then have what it is we need to bear the fruit of loving one another you call us to bear. Whatever it is, God, we need rest. Help us find. Where we need to say no, help us speak it. And help us know who it is we truly are. So when others try to tell us, we already know, God, what you have made us to be, who you call us to be. So we can continue living out your love and sharing your message to all we encounter. This we pray in Jesus' name. Sometimes I was from the work I did, and, but most of the times, I mean, you could probably explain it, but, you know, I'm blessed, is what I'm trying to say. And I've received way more than I probably ever should have. And, you know, sometimes I, I just have that difficult time of letting go and offering just a little back of what's been given to me. But that's what we're challenged to do as Christians, as believers. We offer what's been given to us. And in these pandemic times, you don't put the plate right under your nose and hold it there until you pull out your wallet. I don't know how you all do it, but this is how we did it back in Rovina. We just held it there until so tracks for a if Bovina's listening, I'm sorry for lying about you. But, uh, we do give back. And we have offering plates out in the foyer for uh, your gifts as you leave. For all those that are still participating in online worship, our uh, address is 202 North Franklin Street. And we appreciate all gifts received. Uh, so. And we know that the gifts that we do give are blessed. 
May we join together in singing the dots. Right. 
Barnabas in our hearts. That we receive the grace, peace, and love you have for us. We pray, God, that your spirit fill these gifts of bread, these gifts of the vine, that, they, that your spirit fills them and fills us as we take it. Knowing that you have made us one with you, one with each other, one with ourselves. Fill our hearts with your joy, your presence. God, we lift up to you all those thoughts that are on our hearts and minds, of those that we care for, those that we think of, and those that we have yet to meet. We pray, God, for all in this world to be filled with your grace, your peace, your love, your hope, your joy. We lift these prayers up to you as we pray together the prayer of Jesus taught us. Pray in our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took the loaf that was on the table, and blessed it, broke it. Gave it to his disciples. Those gathered around the table said, This is my body, broken for you. Each time you do, do so in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And he said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my hand.
go forth loving ourselves first so that we are filled with the love of others. May we go in the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>